everyone. Thank you for joining us. Today we have a special guest speaker with us. Uh, Ziuri is a PhD student at Berkeley AI Research and his uh, work is in efficient deep learning algorithms for large language models and generative AI. Uh, today he will be presenting his latest research on quantizing diffusion models, which is a very interesting uh, piece of work. So over to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Okay, thanks, Matt, for the introduction, and let me share my screen now. So today I'm going to I'm, I'm happy to present this like uh, our recent work, Q diffusion, quantizing the diffusion models, and this is the joint work um, with people with collaborators from Nanjing University, uh, UIUC, and Peking University. So basically, like uh, in the past years like diffusion models have shown great success in generating images with both high diversity and fidelity. And we all know that, that uh, stable diffusion and uh, mid-journey DALI-3, they're, they're all very popular and can create some amazing um, pictures. Uh, however, this kind of, oh, however, the generation process of it uh, is pretty slow right now. And sometimes can be pretty slow which becomes a primary obstacle towards broadening the um, applications of diffusion models. And the prior work has been solving this problem by basic, uh, by mostly reducing the number of steps required in the denoising process, as, um, like as shown in the figures below, uh, which is like a, a very simple demonstration of how diffusion models work by just iteratively adding noise to the image and in the diffusion process and iteratively uh, denoise those uh, those noise up from a Gaussian um, a step by step in the denoising process to generate samples during the inference time. And you can see that this iterative process is quite uh, redundant and those prior works have um, leveraged various different approaches to make this more efficient, like doing this progressive step distillation to distill many steps into only one or two steps or like five steps, a few steps, or using some uh, better, uh, finding better, shorter solutions of the ordinary differential equation in the diffusion model, such as the work like DPM solver plus plus, using some other mathematical inspired methods like ratify flow in the insta flow or the recent uh, consistency models pro, uh, proposed by OpenAI, um, like which is the technique that DALI-3 is based on. Um, however, there is another important factor uh, that has been largely underlooked, uh, which is the fact that the noise estimation used in the diffusion model in its, each iteration itself is computer memory intensive. Uh, let me first look at the examples of stable diffusion. And the figure on the right is a basic demonstration. It's a, just like a simple illustration of how stable diffusion uh, is formed. And it has a backbone of a unit uh, that has like about 860 mi uh, million parameters, which um, and while the whole model with the, the unit combining with the text encoder, the VAE encoder, auto encoder, um, has a parameters of 1,000 million in totals. So basically, you can see here the unit uh, occupies the majority number of a uh, majority portion of the parameters of the stable diffusion. And as long as we um, make this unit efficient, we will just, uh, it, we can stop the major bottleneck in the stable diffusion and makes the whole diffusion model efficient. And um, this, so 800 million parameters is not a small number. Maybe, uh, it not only slows down the inference speed, but can also propose crucial challenges in terms of high memory footprint. And moreover, um, the reason more advanced model, open source model, like stable diffusion XL has like 3 billion parameters. This is close to half of the size of the Lama 7B, the, like those LLMs we usually talk about. 
and it's very crucial to make LM efficient. So uh, from this perspective, we can have a um, we can have a like more detailed, more specific understanding of why we need to uh, why efficiency is pretty important in the diffusion model space. And uh, if people have been uh, if people have been paying attention to the past uh, to the progress of LLMs in the past year, um, you may have noticed that uh, quantization becomes a quite popular technique to speed up LLMs uh, to make out to reduce the memory requirements of LLMs. And similarly, we can also leverage this technique in diffusion models. And um, and uh, in case that the people are not familiar with what quantization is, I'll just use the very brief slides to uh, go over the basic concept. So in the quantization, we basically convert weights and elevations to lower base formats. Like previously, the weights of the uh, and the activations of the models are uh, usually stored in FP32 and or FP16, uh, which is used more often, uh, more commonly during the inference time. And this takes like 16 bits of um, memory, uh, of, of memory required, uh, required to like store this 16, 16 floating point, FP16 floating point format. Uh, however, we can actually use like lower bit formats like int8 or even int4, just using integers and using just four bits of eight bits to, um, to represent those weights and activations. And by using this kind of mapping, uh, from the floating point range to uh, uh, mapping the original num original values uh, that's represented by floating points uh, into a um, shorter uh, range of uh, values represented by integers. And this can, uh, obviously, this can reduce the memory, memory requirements. And also, uh, if we use efficient matrix multiplication kernel for integers, it can also reduce the compute and accelerate the compute. Yeah, and this is just like a pretty um, animation of how quantization is in high level idea. Okay, so um, in this paper, we, we propose to use post-training quantization, uh, PDQ, to directly um, quantize the well-trained diffusion models without retraining. And uh, we want to apply P this PDQ approach to compress the noise estimation model. And um, so what's the special things about diffusion models uh, in terms of uh, when it comes to quantization? There are actually some pretty distinctions between traditional PDQ use cases and PDQ in diffusion models. Uh, and this, uh, this presents both unique challenges and valuable opportunities. So, and so we want to just like uh, leverage those opportunities and efficiently mitigate those associated challenges by our proposed Q-diffusion framework. So at first, let's take a look at the conventional scenarios of PDQ. Like the conventional scenario, like when people usually uh, use PDQ post-training quantization in the past, uh, this usually involves a calibration process that employs either training or the original training data or synthetic data to enhance the accuracy of the quantized model. Like we, we need to calibrate the quantized model, like adjust it a little bit by using uh, from those data. And which is shown in um, on the left of the figures. And uh, so uh, uh, an obvious problem brought by this is that, that those data may be either unavailable due to privacy concerns or poorly aligned uh, if we are, if we try to if we want to use the original training data or it is poorly aligned with the target data distribution if we just want to use synthetic data and the quantized model and also in the inference time like the quantized model only needs to be um, gone over once gone through once in uh, when you want to do a, one, a single inference to get the results. That's in the conventional case. But in diffusion models, um, a, a very an interesting perspective, uh, an interesting property is that we don't need to, we actually don't need to go over this kind of 
um, calibration, uh, this synthetic data, or like using the original training data procedure when we want to consider creating the calibration data set. Since during the inference time, diffusion model is not taking something um, that's in the data set. It's just like taking a sampling of Gaussians. Uh, so we can adapt, adopt, uh, adapt this kind of unique calibration process by simply sampling Gaussians to generate calibration data with the full precision models. And this process can always be data free and aligns with target data distribution given the model is well trained. So this is the opportunity. But we also have the, uh, but there are also challenges. And the iterative computation in the diffusion, diffusion process can lead to accumulation of quantization errors over multiple time steps. Uh, this makes applying conventional PDQ methods, especially when just using naively chosen calibration data sets prone to significant performance drop, as shown in the bottom right of the figures. Uh, if we just uh, render, if we don't calibrately, uh, if we don't deliberately sampling our calibration data set to calibrate, calibrate the diffusion model, the errors will accumulate. Um, so we're, the model won't be calibrated in a good stage and the errors, quantization errors will accumulate across the time steps, uh, across all the time steps during the denoising process using the diffusion model inference time. And the bottom left shows um, the, the sampling, the calibration data set sampling approach that we, uh, that we use in the QDiffusion framework, which I will introduce later, just in the following slides. Yeah, so let's, uh, so let's, uh, let's take a look at this issue in greater details. So these figures shows that uh, solely relying on linear quantization um, can lead to the errors accumulation across time steps, and which uh, we can we can like get some number uh, more qu quantitatively in the right figure. So if we just doing if we just do a wrong to nearest quantization, if we don't do any calibration, this can lead to a rapid increase in mean square errors between the full precision outputs uh, as we progress through the time steps. And this effect is particularly pronounced under lower bit quantities, uh, or, or under lower bit precisions like the phi, int phi and int four. The mean square error is much higher than the, than the int a case um, uh, if we don't do any calibration. So, and if we, so, uh, if we do the calibration, if we do some calibration and use the calibration data set chosen by the QD fusion framework, we can actually manage to maintain the errors within an acceptable, acceptable range, like the int4 errors will be similar to the, the int8 errors um, uh, naively. And this is actually uh, pretty acceptable. And I will show this in the following slides. And, and this, uh, which can be seen in the dotted lines in the figure, uh, by the dotted line in the figure. So, uh, what's the what's the what's the reason behind this? Like, why uh, we get these accumulated errors? Uh, why cannot we just simply choose some random um, Gaussians and and cal calibrate the model effectively? So. One underlying factor to this is that the, there is a significant variation in the intermediate activations across different time steps. And given, so given that the denoising occurs incrementally throughout the process, we observe that inputs at adjacent or like consecutive time steps will have relatively similar distributions. And inputs at distant time steps are distributed more diversely as shown in this figure. Like these are just like the activation range uh, across the different time steps. Like um, this, you can you can see from this figure the changes are pretty gradual, and and the trend the the, the numbers at the beginnings are very different from the number in the end. And these patterns um, happens um, for all the intermediate. Uh, so this, so the previous figure is for the final output. And this pattern actually holds for all the intermediate layers, uh, intermediate outputs at each layer. So we can all see this kind of similar 
um, now similar patterns like the in the neighboring time steps the, the the difference is not that large but in the distant times but if you just like put this into a wider range then in the distant time step you can have pretty different activation distributions and this is very this is actually quite intuitive as the denoising process is just like starting from a sample taken from an isotropic gaussian distribution and you and the noise is gradually added to the image so intuitively uh the the sample at, at neighboring steps won't be that different but the stamp sample in distant steps will be pretty different and, and this process is actually quite um quite uh, uniform won't be very uh, the, the change won't be very fierce across uh, steps um, as long as you are not using too many steps uh, sorry too few steps so uh, this led us to design a time step aware calibration strategy which uniformly segments the time steps into fixed intervals and draw an equal number of samples within each intervals as shown in the figure and in this way, it ensures that our calibration data set to have a comprehensive coverage of the activation modes across the entire temporal spectrum, and which will make which will create a high quality calibration data set and ideally makes the model adapt to different adapt to all the different activation distribution across all the time steps. And uh, the 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 figures uh. And on the right is just a like high-level overview of our algorithm. And I won't go over the specifics at this moment. But uh, and if you are very if you're interested in this, you can uh, it can be found the more details can be found in our paper. But in essence, so we want to partition the noise estimation no, uh, network into distinct blocks. Like here is like uh, uh, one to n, uh, n blocks. And we calibrate, we conduct the calibration using a blockwise adaptive rounding strategy. And with the calibration data set sample uniformly across the segmented time step intervals, as I mentioned, as I just mentioned. And this will be done for both the waste and activations. Yeah, so this is the this is the calibration, this is from the calibration data set perspective. And we know that in a diffusion model, we need to uh, create this kind of calibration data sets, considering all the, uh, considering the iterative sampling, uh, iterative, yeah, iterative, iterative process in the diffusion model inference. And um, and then a natural question here could be that why we just do this uniformly, and will are there better ways? Like this sounds pretty naive. And we actually did some uh, exploration in, uh, we actually did many exploration in from this perspective. And I will talk about this in the ablation studies later in the presentation. Now let's just like uh, move to the other parts a little bit. So other than, um, other than the challenges introduced by the iterative sampling inherent in diffusion models, um, the architecture of the noise estimation network uh, using the diffusion model presents its own challenges. So usually a UNET is used in the diffusion model. And we found that there are abnormal activation weight distributions in the shortcut layers in the in, in those UNETs, in those um, in the shortcut layers of the uh, noise estimation model, like where, where UNET just concatenate the, the shallow features and deep features uh, within those, uh, using those shortcuts. And this actually creates very abnormal activation and weight distributions, and can and if you just quantize this layer as a whole, it can hurt the quantization performance. Like uh, as demonstrated in this figure, the three shortcuts layers in the unit, the first three shortcuts in the unit um, can have very abnormal input activation ranges. And this is also just like um, a further illustration of uh, of that this pattern can be observed across um, different models, different data sets, and uh, like in different data sets like CFR10, like the stable diffusion. Uh, wait, for stable diffusion, I think. Um, 
Yeah, I think yeah, for stable, it's just like the model, like in in the inference time of the model. So in in the DDIM trained on Silver Ten, stable diffusion trained on Lion, and those latent diffusion trained on L sounds, we can all observe similar. Um, similar abnormal distributions in the shortcut layer in some of the shortcut layers, um, in the in the in the model in the noise estimation model. And sometimes this is large, like in CVR10 in stable diffusion, you can find that those activations are very abnormal, like one one thousand. Uh, it is one thousand while the others are below two hundred, or like three hundred while the others are below fifty. But for other for other um, models trained on other data sets, it can be um, less severe. Like in the Elson bedroom or Elson church, it's not uh, the, it's not that abnormal. So um, so we don't need always, we, we, we don't always need to apply this shortcut. Uh, we don't need always, we don't always need to address this issue. But once it, once those differences become, those abnormal patterns become significant, if we don't address it, then it will become a big problem. And um, so, because those shortcut layers merge the deep and shallow features, and it can, and uh, it conducts this kind of concatenation. So the the distribution, the, this abnormal distribution in nature can have a very um, very clear patterns, like it will just be a bimodal distribution in the corresponding channels. And since it's just like a concatenation. And so we, we propose a very simple, a very straightforward technique to address this issue. And we call this the split quantization techniques, which performs the quantization prior to the, um, to the concatenation. And uh, basically, uh, as shown in the figures in the right, like we just uh, split the both the inputs and the weights, um, and applies the qu applies quantizations to the split to x one and x two separately. Uh, uh, where x one and x two is the activation, so applying the tensor bias quantization, and also applies the quantization for w one and w two separately. And since they are weights, we use channel wise quantization, and in this way, um, and we 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 concat them, and uh, we only concat them after uh, after the quantization was performed. Um, so in this way, it's it's just like it is it is equ equivalent to just quantizing them as a whole mathematically, and it introduces like just negligible uh, additional memory or compute, just like a uh, one additional. Uh, one 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 group of additional scaling factors and and uh, zero points, which is basically negligible compared to the memory saving brought by quantization. And but this will significantly stop the uh, alleviate this issue. Yeah. So here. So um, until this point, uh, do people have any questions so far? Okay, so then um, let's let's take a look at the results. So first, we did some experiments in the unconditional generation, and just want to remind you guys uh, a little bit. So this work is actually quite early. Like it's uh, it's mo most of the work are done last uh, in the last year, like around a similar time last year, and at that time. Um, stable diffusion hasn't been out for <laughs> too long, so we are still using those conventional tasks to evaluate the models. And it, the space is not that um, uh, it's not that uh, amazing like what we have seen right now. Just uh, just want to give you guys a heads up about how this field is evolving, how fast this field is has been evolving over the past year, and. So first, we did some experiments in uh, by uh, in the unconditional generation case. Like we use those conventional data set of the Elson bedroom and Elson church, which is um ha which has the resolution of two hundred fifty six times two hundred fifty six. And the figures, uh, you can see that qualitatively, qualitatively, 
while the image quality generated using linear quantization. Basic, uh, by linear quantization, I mean the naive run to nearest quantization. And while the, those qual the quality of images generated by the linear, quanti linear quantization degrees sharply under four bit, under four -bit precision, uh, Q diffusion can largely our Q diffusion can largely retain the perceptual quality and introducing only imperceptible distor distortions, like in the this like W four A eight cases in bedroom and church. It's the the images are basically identical to the FP thirty two models results. And quantitatively, we also re uh, it also reveals that. Q diffusion outperforms traditional uni uniform PDQ approaches by a substantial margin uh, across all testy resolutions and types of diffusion models. Like uh, other than the run to nearest linear quantization, we also used another state of the art uh, PDQ methods at that time, uh, which is S quant. And, and we can see that in the lower precision, like four base weights, um, Q diffusion can has a very big advantage um, over those traditional PDQ approaches. Like basically, they will um, incur some significant loss in the generation quality if 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 those traditional approaches are just applied naively. And while in our cases, if, if the Q, Q diffusion framework is applied. They are actually just like very small or uh, very small degradation in terms of the FID scores and uh, and the in inception scores. Yes, yeah, so this is the qualitative and quantitative. This is just like a brief overview of the qualitative and quanti uh, quantitative results of the unconditional generation. And let's take a look at um, some more realistic tasks like people, some tests that people care about more, uh, which is the results in the text to image generation. And we use stable diffusion 1.4 at that time um, to, um, as, the, as a model to test on. So from this figure, like uh, we use the prompt, the, 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 cla the, the classic prompt uh, photograph of an astronaut riding a horse and in in those figures, like you can see, that uh, Q diffusion quantized models yields high quality images that faithfully represent the semantic information. And uh, both in the F W four A thirty two case and W four A eight case, uh, like four bit ways and uh, F thirty two activation or four bit ways eight bit activation. Uh, I just realized that I forgot to um, go over what uh, the notations, but. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, hopefully, there's no confusion about what W W four A three two and W four A eight mean. And while in the linear quantization case, the the, the image basically becomes very corrupted, and uh, the quality just like becomes very bad. And so, uh, so this is actually a pretty interesting results, and uh, it shows some promising results in. Uh, uh, it demonstrates that Q diffusion can actually quantize the state. Uh, although we do not specifically design Q diffusion for for uh, those classifier guidance, classifier free guidance ways of text to image generation, conditional generation, it can still work for those um, text to image generation, uh, like in di stable diffusion. And to the best of our knowledge, at that time, this is the first study to successfully implement stable diffusion at 4B precision. Like we, um, like we don't see any other people uh, achieving 4-bit at that time. And even at, uh, even for now, I, I don't see there are many works that can get into this lower this low bit of precision. And I, I will introduce other works in the later slides. I just like briefly go over other. Uh, work in the later slides. So, and um, in addition to the generation quality, like another, I just want to point out a very interesting uh, properties that we observed during the experiments. Like, so uh, if you look at those figures in the red circle, 
you can see that there are some interesting differences in the semantics of those generative pictures. Like in, they can be in different ways. Like in the first, in the first row, uh, uh, the people on the horse has different wear different colors of astronauts, um, uh, different colors of suit. Like it can be color, it can be environment, it can be alignment, it can be posture. Like in the second row, it's just like uh, the whole, uh, it, the, the picture is just like put into a very different environments. In in the third in the third rows, the uh, the FP thirty two model actually doesn't faithfully follow doesn't face isn't uh, faithfully aligned with the prompt, while our four bit quantized models um, have the correct semantics aligned with the prompts aligning with the prompts. And in the last row, the posture of the horse uh, um, are different. So this, uh, this is actually a pretty interesting um, properties we observed when doing those quantization experiments, which, and we didn't, in, so this works, um, it this isn't really the focus of this work. Like we don't actually investigate this property in details, but I think um, it shows some interest, it may shed some light in some interesting research directions like controllable generation or how we can improve the quantization or maybe even using quantization as a way not only to improve the efficiency but also as a way to uh, improve the generation quality like and synth and and this kind of makes a little bit uh, makes some sense as it's not it's not uncommon to use those quantization to use some general quantization techniques in com in, uh, in the com computer vision. Like we have those VQ GANs or stuff like this. So maybe sometimes uh, quantization can be helpful. But this is just like some uh, something I would like to talk about. We didn't really uh, go into details of of this stuff. Yeah, and there are just like more examples of uh, the other problem, a puppy wearing a hat, and we can see similar, we observe similar results as what we observed in the in the other case that I just showed. I just showed. And we can also see that there are some um, semantic, there are some, there are some changes in the semantics uh, by uh, from the images generated by the quantized models. Um, and sometimes the, 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 the difference is large, sometimes a small and uh, it's just like some very interesting and it's hard to tell which one is better but uh, both of them have high quality and both of them align with the prompt but uh, but they are just like semantically different so this is just like pretty interesting and here is just like here is just some um, uh, some experiments of the of evaluating our quantized stable diffusion quality quantitatively by using the FID scores and clip score computed in the MS COCO dataset and following the previous people's approaches uh, in this in when they study the stable diffusion. And uh, yeah, it actually is following the SD 1.5 official reports approaches. And uh, the Q diffusion doesn't really have uh, maintain similar clip scores and has negligible increases in FID, so also similar FID scores um, as the FP32 cases, like which is represented by the dotted line. Uh, in, bo uh, in both figures, it's the dotted line, uh, where, where in FID is 20 and in the clip score is like 0 0.2865. And, and the interesting thing about FID is that Q diffusion is actually achieving better results than FP32, and which doesn't, uh, which is quite weird. And we attribute this to the fact that FID is not a good metric in evaluating when the model becomes so good as stable diffusion. Uh, when, when we want to evaluate the quality of text to image generation in, in stable diffusion. And I think this is actually um, proposed by many other people as well in the diffusion model just in the diffusion model um, field. Like right now, is evaluation is always a difficult thing and those uh, quant quantitative metric can just be used as a reference. They don't actually mean whether, you call it, whether the quality of the image is um, a, a, um, a better 
when when the result when it cannot reflect uh, when the models are just pretty good and the the small variations in the number cannot um, reflect uh, whether one model is better than the other. Uh, with this said, like uh, a very high FID scores or a very low k score definitely indicate that the model is not good, which is the case of the wrong to nearest linear quantization. So uh, this just provides more evidence showing that our methods are pretty effective uh, when it is applied to the stable diffusion. Yeah, and we then perform some, we also perform some ablation studies of uh, the effectiveness of each of the techniques uh, we propose that I mentioned in the previous slides, the, the calibration, uh, the calibration with the with this uniform sampling and the uh, shortcut splitting. So in the epi, in the when you when we just like quantize the weights, uh, if we if we keep the activations to full precision, like uh, the shortcut splitting, so the calibration will be very effective, and shortcut splitting also helps a bit. So both of them helps. But shortcut splitting is not that crucial. But when we also quantize the activations. Like now we have this by abnormal distributions in both weights and activations. And we will find that only using the calibration will not be enough to quantize the model, to recover the performance of the quantized model while simply doing this uh, shortcut splitting quantization. Um, we can recover the performance quite well. Yeah, so it shows that the effectiveness of both of the proposed approaches and they will be very useful in different cases. And qualitatively, we also have these interesting figures. Like uh, if we don't consider, if we don't consider calibration, if we just do a splitting, uh, the shortcut splitting quantization, like in the in the six bit precision case, uh, it can already like get some improvements, like the teeth of the previous figure, uh, teeth before applying the split are kind of um, not in a good shape. But after doing this shortcut splitting quantization, the teeth of the the teeth of the this person just becomes uh, go back to normal. And then if we also apply the, if we also apply the calibration, if we apply the, all the techniques of Q diffusion and in the four bit precision case, like uh, the generative image will just be um, almost identical um, to the FP32 results, will just be aligned with the FP32 results very well. Although, although this eyes, although I don't think like uh, the eyes of the third figure is better, it actually, ha actually has better quality than the eyes of the second figure, but uh, it does align better with the full precision results, showing that our uh, quantized models becomes uh, gets more faithfully compared to the full precision model. Yeah, and as I mentioned earlier, when we talk about the uh, calibration data set sampling, mm -hmm. like we explore uh, whether we can get some better, more advanced sampling strategies other than uniform sampling, since this is just like too intuitive and pretty pretty simple. And can we actually do better? And like we try many different um, different like criteria of sampling. Like we try to we try to uh, which like we try the STD, which is like assigning the weights, assigning the weights coefficients of the uh, of of each time step by the pixel wise STD of the of the activations. And the intuition is that we want to sample more data from the time step with a larger variance in its distribution to better cover the whole um, time uh, temporal spectrum. And we try the variant of this STD methods by using the norm of the activations instead of the just the values of the or the average of the values that, of the pixels. We also try the self-supervised uh, learning methods called unsupervised selective labeling. And uh, this met in the and the original paper, the original USL paper um, aims to select both representative and diverse samples for self-supervised learning. And we hope 
we we think this principle can also be applied to the calibration data set creation in the quantization case. And we also tried this USL methods. And the last methods we didn't conduct the the, the last methods normally distributed time normally distributed time step calibration collection. And this is the methods uh, used by um, another paper, another concurrent work called PDQ for DM, and which is another work that explores quantization in diffusion models. And we didn't really want some extensive experiments as the previous three that we proposed when we tried this DNTC methods, but we uh, we did reproduce their, we, we did try reproducing their results uh, in uh, that's described in the PDQ for DM paper. And the results are um, um, a bit dis disappointing. Like we didn't really get better results by any of the techniques um, that we tried. Uh, any of the technique that may may consider more than the uniform sampling, like we actually just get a little bit worse FID scores in on CIFAR ten, and we fail we fail to observe significant differences between uh, those different sampling strategies, and we we don't observe improvements. And we assume that this um, actually the, the 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 reason behind this might be. That the the uniform sampling is already pretty is already good enough. Like we think a key of of creating this kind of calibration data set is that we need to cover all the time steps. We want to cover the entire temporal spectrum. And and once we cover the entire temp temporal spectrum, it can align with the motivation of uh, it can just like aligns with how diffusion is done. Like we can just like by just sampling uniformly, we already address, uh, as long as we sample all the time steps uniformly, we, all, we already address the gradually changing activation modes across the steps. There might be some other, um, other coarse grain, more, more, more fine grain consideration, but they may not matter to the quantization quality that much. Uh, if we want to further improve the quantization quality, it may like, just like, using different calibration data set might not be helpful you need to do something else and in terms of and speaking of calibration itself doing uniform quantization is already good enough like as shown in the in the figures in the two figures um on these slides like uh, uh when we just sample part of the time steps part of the temporal spectrum you the results just decrease significantly like uh, first 25, first 50, last 50, and last 25. And the mid 50 kind of has some coverage of the early time step and some coverage of the later time steps. It gets better results than the other cases, but still worse than sampling uh, the full full time steps, full range of time steps, time steps. And this can be illustrated in the figures on the right. And uh, the figures on the right, is, um, in addition to exploring covering the whole time step, all the time steps, the the figure on the right also uh, explore uh, some hyperparameter choices of uh, the uniform sampling, and and as long and and from the figures it shows that as long as we cover all the time steps, the results won't be that different, and we just choose. We just choose one configuration to balance the number of samples required and the quality of the gen and the generation quality in terms of FID, and which is denoted by the green star sign, a uh, green star label. And we, and we did some exploration of combining Q diffusion with some fast sampling approach to see that. Uh, remember at the beginning of this talk, I mentioned that there are two there are two lines of work. Uh, there, there are two factors that we can tackle on to accelerate diffusion model to make diffusion model more efficient. And previous people mostly do uh, mostly focus on fast sampling, and we want to see if we can combine Q diffusion, the the uh, the, the methods that tackles the noise estimation model with those fast sampling approach to. Just like get a to join force to get a better um to, to boost the efficiency of the diffusion models even more. And we used we follow the we follow the instructions of the DPM solver plus plus paper. We use the third order DPM solver with like either 20 denoising time steps or 50 denoising time steps. 
like the 20 is basically for stable diffusion since originally stable diffusion already just used 15, 50 times uh, denoise and 10 steps, time steps. And after applying DPM solver plus plus, we want to reduce this to 20. And from the table on the left, uh, we see that Q diffusion works decently when only quantizing the weights. The FID doesn't decrease that much, but uh, doesn't doesn't get doesn't get worse that much. But uh, once we also apply the activation quantization, like uh, the results actually kind of decrease significantly. And we think this is because that at the activation distribution at each step will significantly change after changing these kind of sampling trajectories by applying DPM solvers plus plus. And this probably needs further calibration to align the qualized model with these changing activation distributions. And the figures on the right just show some, just illustrate some samples, generated samples from the stable diffusion by only quantizing the weights and applying the DPM solver plus plus to accelerate uh, the sampling. And uh, the most of the qualities from the figures, most of the quality are preserved after applying DPM solver plus plus plus, plus and the uh, Q diffusion. So, and we and this could be an interesting direction to explore in the future. Like uh, when people want to get an end-to-end -end solution that um, they just like exploit the efficiency of diffusion models to the best of the extent. Yeah. So here are just like all the experiments that we have conducted in terms of performance and um, in terms of like the quality, the generation quality or the theoretical saving in the memory or like or, uh, the theoretical precision that we can get without losing quality in uh, uh, when applying qualization to some precisions. And these are just like all the results in the paper. And I also would like to talk um, about I also would like to discuss and talk about uh, the implementation a bit. And since since if we really want to um, make this work, we need to implement this in an end-to-end -end fashion to get real speed up and memory saving. So previously, all the results are just done by simulated quantization, which people can sometimes call it fake quantization. And and it doesn't really get speed up the memory saving. It's just like applying the scaling factor and zero points and, and this casting and the integer casting to the results, uh, to, 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 the, to the inference process to mimic the, uh, the process, process of, um, of what real quantization will be like. And we can, we can, get, a, we can get the same perform, we can get the same generation quality as when we apply end-to-end -end quantization, but it's just a simul simulation. And there are some, there are already some existing implementations of quantized diffusion, stable diffusions, but um, they all have some pretty large limitations, like um, two open source ones, uh, the Apple Core ML implementation, uh, Apple just open source, uh, Apple open source and um, quantized diffusion, stable diffusion implementation in core ML. And there's also an Intel open vinyl implementation. So these two figures shows that uh, once this kind of, so many people have asked me what will be the speed up and memory saving when we really implemented this quantization. And I think these two figures can give people some sense about their, uh, about, about that there will be real speed up. Um, when using the when applying quantization, and the memory saving will be also be very significant, as shown in the this open vinyl figure, which is which is a Pokemon variance of the stable diffusion, and it gets like a zero point. It, it reduces the memory footprint by four times when uh, doing the AB quantization, uh, which is just like the theoretical limits, and we can do this. Uh, even further when doing four bit. Um, yeah, so so these are just like some some existing implementations of quantized stable diffusion. And um, and which can give people some sense of how Q diffusion will accelerate diffusion models when it's implemented in an end-to-end -end fashion. And 
for some future work. Um, there are a few different directions. Uh, there are many directions that people can do. At first, uh, we, we need more comprehensive and dedicated studies on conditional generation, on, on the stable diffusion. And since this paper, I uh, just want to emphasize this again, this paper is done uh, pretty early. It's finished pretty early. And at that time, we didn't really consider conditional generation that much. And we just, we just use stable diffusion as something similar in the fashion of proof of concept. But in order to make quantization really useful in real life, we need to test on more advanced models like stable diffusion Excel. We need to try more variety of tests like image editing, inpainting, outpainting, all those things. And we also need to address uh, different issues, different potential issues in those more realistic use cases, like how will quantization be respond to non-trivial problem engineering? Like if you guys have played with um, DALI 3 or, or Mid-Journey, which is a more suitable example, like you, uh, you may have the feeling that usually you need to use very long prompt to get the results that um, to add many constraints and then you can finally get the uh, results that you uh, that you expect. And also combining the quantized quantized model with control net with those different customized LoRa modules and see how the performance will will be affected by quantization. So this is the most important direction, future direction. And um, and uh, if you guys have paid some close attention to the figures I displayed in the previous slides, uh, there can actually uh, it can also, it can actually be observed that there are still some artifacts when uh, when activation quantization is also applied in addition to the waste quantization, and and this can actually be further improved. Like we may there there could be some more dedicated quantization techniques for diffusion models to address those issues, to further boost up the performance, uh, the, the generation quality. And there are already many follow-ups, like uh, for the sake of time, I won't talk about this, uh, each of them, but uh, the key idea is like each of these matters, like PDQD, ADPDM, TDQ, TFMQ, DM, or each of these matters address some different uh, issues, different short, uh, shortcomings of the Q diffusion. And, um, and to further to to study to better study the diffusion model quantization and boosting up the performance, and I think there could be more there uh, more things could be done in this sense. Since um, I don't think any of these matters really address the previous point I made, like they they mostly just follow my our paper's evaluation protocol, but uh, uh, they they have some improvements, but we still don't know. Uh, how they will perform on those more realistic use cases like non-trivial from engineering or with, with control net added. And we can also try leveraging some other advancements in quantization in general, such as using smooth quant to alleviate for the to alleviate the activations in the linear layers of stable diffusion. Like in stable diffusion Excel, the linear layer is actually quite large and uh, using smooth quant could be potentially helpful or using some other quantization formats that has been recently um, uh, attracting more attention after the Hopper architecture is proposed by NVIDIA. Uh, it's, it, yeah, it's proposed by NVIDIA, like the FE8 or FE4 formats other than int8 and int4. And this can potentially also boost up the, perform the quality, generation quality, or like make quantization easier. And those are all just some valuable future direction to explore. Yeah, and and in the end, I'm also, I just want to bring up the topic of end-to-end -end quantization implementation again, like as I, as I talk about in these slides. And this is just like a very, this is not, um, this is not a research problem, but it's just a very important in terms of uh, adoption, in terms of making this quantization really useful. And right now, I think people all have the feeling of the, the matters will only be useful uh, once uh, the matters, the, the, the proposed paper will only be useful when it's adopted by the community. And which means we need to get a working implementation for the community. And there are no open source end-to-end -end quantization diffusion model implementation for CUDA GPUs. Like previously, 
I brought up the Apple Core ML library. I brought up the Open Vinyl. But Apple Core ML, they only did weight classification, and they are actually using non-uniform classification. So this cannot be done for activations. And it's also just work on, it also just work, it also only works on the app home devices like MacBooks or iPhones. And open vinyls is also only for Intel CPUs. And for diffusion model, people it will still be preferable to use some GPUs for the inference and maybe some lower end GPU. And the the, mean, the, the meaning of quant the purpose of quantization is to make those diffusion models work on the lower end GPUs. And many people have brought up this up in the issues uh, in, in our GitHub. Uh, and I actually consider implementing, uh, this was on our roadmap, was on our roadmap, but it's just like, uh, we later found that it's very non-trivial to implement. Like uh, the following, the, the figure here is just like something I put in the issue of our GitHub. And uh, it's non-trivial to apply to implement this end-to-end -end quantization for both weights and activation, since uh, diffusion model is not like LLMs. It doesn't only have the linear layers, it also have the column layers. And I and, and surprisingly, there is no good open source implementation of int8 count, even int8 um, count layers. Like even for the intake com, as a naive intake com, com layers, we need to do some uh, pay some efforts to make it work. Like we um, one one technical one one pass that I I was considering is to use Catalyst, and which is a, like a customized CUDA libraries um, uh, created by Nvidia, and I was considering using Catalyst to implement this uh, int eight com kernels and and also the int8 linear kernels and but um this this just like needs um to and, and needs us to pay some non-trivial efforts and uh, right now we are very um we are very overloaded with other pressing commitments so uh this is an important topic but we don't know when this will be happening uh, once we have time, we definitely want to do this. But other than that, I just want to bring this up and let people know that this is a very important thing. And this is surprisingly, surprisingly, this is still lacking in the community. And uh, if any people is interested, feel free to contact me and see uh, if you and discuss how how people can do this. Yeah, yeah. So this is just like this is all of my presentation, and thank you for listening. And now I can please feel free to ask any questions about my talk. Uh, great talk. Uh, I had a small question. Uh, you mentioned that there are uh, abnormal activations uh, in in the diffusion model. So can you uh, shed some more light? Like, what's the reason we do have these abnormal diffu uh, abnormal activations? And like, can we fix it? And will that improve the quantization process? Uh, so yeah, sure. So just want to make sure I understand the question clearly. So you mean that? Uh, I was asking. I was talking about that if we can, if we can fix this abnormal uh, abnormal activation without changing the quantization process. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. Um, we haven't thought about this too much since it's just like pretty simple to do this split uh, shortcut splitting technique. And so one thing I can immediately think about. And which may not be useful in this case, but it's also, uh, but the problems are kind of similar. It's the smooth quant technique, like which kind of, which apply, which can be applied to the linear layer and that mitigate um, the abnormal activations in, 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 one, in one of the ways or activations by just like averaging these kind of abnormal channels um, uh, to both of the weight and activation matrices. But I, I, I'm not sure whether, I, I, don't, I think this is not 
uh, in in the diffusion model case, it's not the same. And also, um, and also, these abnormal distributions can also be viewed as um, as a general can also be categorized as a general problem of outliers in the quantization research. Outlier is always a um, problem. Like quantization research, basically, is all about how to deal deal with the outliers. And usually dealing with outliers is not is not easy. And I think this shortcut splitting is or is already an easy way of addressing these outliers or addressing these abnormal um, activations compared to other outliers, um, other approaches to deal with outliers in the previous quantization literature. Since we have this, um, we have this like explicit pattern of concatenation. Yeah, does this answer your question or? Yeah, thanks. Any other questions? Yeah, there's a question in chat. Oh, there's a question in the chat. So that's a that's a good question. So we so currently you and my research is actually focusing on some other stuff, and I think right now we don't have a plan to further explore this diversity in the lower level semantics between Q diffusion and FT models. But I do think this is an interesting uh, research topic, and uh, just and I will and just feel free to. Uh, discuss this with me, like uh, if you are interested in this topic. But right now, we don't have a plan to uh, work on this ourselves. Yeah. All right. I think we can end the session. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Ahmed, for organizing this event. Yeah. My pleasure. Mm -hmm. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye. <laughs>